So we are honored that you're here today, and what a blessing and a joy it is to be in the house of God, and what a great opportunity to be a part of community, because that is what we're talking about uh, for the next few weeks, 40 days, six weeks. We're going to be talking about the power of community, and we really do, again, you're going to hear this for the next six weeks, get connected. We would love for you to be a part of one of our small groups. All of our small groups are going to be doing the same theme this semester. Uh, we're going to be drilling down on what is community? And what I really believe God is doing is I've been praying about this, uh, as Miss Diane said this morning. How y'all love Miss Diane Snyder? Opened us up in prayer this morning. <laughs> Curtis and Diane, they're elders in our church. But as, as she was talking, as she said, we've been praying now for weeks and we've been preparing our hearts and a lot of planning, a lot of preparation going into making this happen. The thing that I really felt like the Lord just has really just kind of drilled down in my heart is the fact that when we strengthen the community of faith, it empowers us to reach our community that's in the world. When you strengthen the community of faith, it empowers us to reach the community that's in the world around us. And let me tell you what I believe with all my heart the world needs. The world needs the church to be the church. The world needs a strong community of faith. More than we need political or financial uh, change, we need spiritual transformation in our nation. And that only happens one place, and that is the church. It's the body of Christ. And so today, as we kind of launch into these 40 days of community, uh, we're going to do a couple things. We're going to talk about this morning specifically why we need each other. And I don't know if you realize that, but you and I actually really do need one another. And community is essential to what God wants to do in our lives and in the world. So look with me at Romans chapter 5. We've seen a glimpse of this verse this morning already in our prayer. But the Bible says this, not Romans chapter, Romans chapter 12 verse 4 and 5. It says, just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong and we all need each other. How many of you know that we are the body of Christ, not you? You are not the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. You are a member of of the body, but we are the body of Christ. That's why isolation and separation and individualism is a disease that undermines the work of Christianity. The idea that I can live life on my own, the idea that I don't need anybody, the idea that I can do this. And, and there are many even Christians that think they can live their Christian life in their own little bubble. But I want you to hear me today. I want you to understand we need each other. We are the body of Christ. And we read last week out of 1 Corinthians where the Bible says the hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. And the ear can't say the eye, I, I don't need you. Why? Just because we're different doesn't mean we, doesn't mean we don't need each other. The fact that we are different is why we do need each other. You see things I don't see. You know things I don't know. You have experiences that I've never experienced. And together we are the body of Christ. And that's a powerful, powerful thing. So look at that first point. So we need each other. We need others, think about this, to walk with us. We need others to walk with us through life. Why? Because community is God's answer to loneliness. Statistics tell us today that in our social media culture that people are more connected than they've ever been in their lives, but they're more lonely than they've ever been. They're more connected, but they're more lonely. As a matter of fact, suicide rates are continually increasing, and we're seeing even among young people who are the most socially connected group of people on the planet, suicide rates are continuing to abound and abound and abound. Why? Because they have followers and likes, but they don't have friends. They don't actually have somebody that's walking beside them. I don't just need somebody to follow and like me on social media. I need somebody to walk with me. I need some flesh and blood. I need God with skin on him. Come on, somebody. 
And how many of you know that's what you are? You are the church, right? We are the body of Christ. And you are God with skin on. Jesus robed himself in flesh. And then he sent the church to be the body of Christ. And we need people not just to like and follow us. But we need people to walk with us through life. Look with me in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 2. The Bible says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper who is just right for him. Now in the context of this scripture, God is actually speaking about Adam. And he's talking about he's going to create Eve. God in Genesis 2 is talking about forming what we now know as marriage. Biblical marriage. How many know between one man and one woman? Can I get an amen? Amen. And God in Genesis formed that. But I want you to see something. I want you to see something maybe even just a little bit bigger than that. In Genesis chapter 1, every time God created something, God said, It is good, it is good, it is good, it is good, it is good. And in Genesis chapter 2, God says, It is not good. And you know what was not good? It was not good for man to be alone. We were created in the genesis of time by the heart of God to be in community with each other. We were created for a fellowship of believers, brothers and sisters in Christ that make us better and stronger together than we could ever be on our own. And we need each other. It is not good for you or me to be alone. Now, I want to do something this morning. we got a couple of little special treats today. I'm going to ask Michael Kelly, if you would. Michael, come up here this morning. Michael's been a part of our Liberty Church family for about seven years. And I asked Michael to share a little testimony. And he wrote out his testimony about why community matters to him. Let's give him a great big Liberty Church welcome this morning. Thank you, Pastor Keith. Yes, sir. One of the hardest things I've struggled with in my life is to be bold enough to initiate conversations or relationships with people I don't know well. I know that's a fleshly struggle, and I do get excited when I get past the hurdle and start to meet new people. One of the things that excite me the most about heaven is we will truly be a forever family who know and love each other the way God loves us. Do we have to wait? Can we or shouldn't we be striving for that now? I'm one of the people who usually ends up in the back of the room sitting from the crowd, too nervous to get too close to anyone, so I don't have a lot of room to talk. But I know that's not God's will or plan for any of us. Every time I end up in a conversation or fellowship encounter with believers, I feel stronger, encouraged, and honestly, for me, I usually get the biggest growth revelations during a back and forth fellowship experience with other believers. Bible studies and sermons really start connecting in the context of conversations. Our faith is wrapped up in relationships, first with our Father in heaven, but that extends to all his children. Every one or thing that he loves, we love. Relationships are where love thrives. You can't love if you're always alone. Who are you loving? If we believe love is the goal, then relationships are just as much the goal. You can't have one without the other. I'm truly excited about the 40 days of community. I know God's going to do big things in our church, helping us to be more his family. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 10. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to lift him up. I love you, Michael. When I read Michael's testimony, what I loved about his story was his struggle. The fact that Michael was willing to be honest and transparent with us and talk about the fact that he really struggles with connecting, that he really struggles with getting off the back row and meeting new people and talking to new people. Let's just be honest, it really is intimidating, right? It's intimidating walking into a church for the first time when you don't really know anybody. It's intimidating showing up at somebody's house or maybe at one of our modulars for a small group when really the only thing you know about that person is you waved at them across the room on Sunday morning. But but I want to just encourage you in something. What I love about his story is he said that our faith is wrapped up in relationships our relationship with God and our relationship 
with other people and how powerful that is. And he talked about how that some of the greatest growth and some of the greatest revelation he has ever gotten about God has come out of those conversations. It's out of those relationships as we talk about the Word and talk about what God is saying, what God is doing in our own lives. All of a sudden it opens this amazing door into our life where we begin to experience things and see things and know things that we could have never known on our own. So, Michael, I love you, sir. Thank you so much for sharing. Let's give him one more hand clap of praise this morning. So let me encourage you. Be brave. Be courageous. Take that step. Push past your fear as Michael did this morning. How many of you know the guy on the back row now standing on the stage with a microphone in his hand? <laughs> Took a little courage this morning. So press through the fear. Let Michael be an inspiration to you this morning that, you know what, I can take that step. And you know what I've never found out? I've never found out that people ever really regret connecting to other people. Yes, there's challenges, and yes, there are difficulties, and we're going to even talk about that today. But at the end of the day, most of us can recognize that some of the greatest treasures we have in our lives absolutely 100% come from the relationships that we build with other people. Amen? All right, look at that next point. So we need each other. Why do we need each other? Because we need others not just to walk with us in community, but we need others to work with us. Because community is God's answer to fatigue. I was thinking about this and praying through this little thought right here that, that we need others to work with us. And I was just thinking about the idea that the truth is, the truth is I really can't do your work and you really can't do my work. I mean, if I showed up at your job tomorrow, they wouldn't let me in the building, right? And if you showed up at the office on Tuesday and somebody was coming to meet with Pastor Keith and you were sitting in my office, they probably wouldn't be real happy either. I mean, I can't do your work and you can't do my work, but this is what we can do. You know what we can do? We can share the weight of our work. We can share the weight of of our work because it's not just what we do for 40, 50, or 60 hours a day. It's the labor of life. I mean, it's the job, it's the family, it's the finances. It's just life that becomes a weight of work. And we're working and we're serving and we're doing all these things through our lives. And it sometimes gets overwhelming and exhausting. And the Holy Spirit gave, so I wrote it down so I wouldn't mess it up. Let me just read it to you. He said, Keith, most people are not overwhelmed by what they're doing. They are overwhelmed by how they think about what they're doing. Most people are not overwhelmed by what they're doing. Most people are overwhelmed by how they think about what they're doing. And then he said this. He said, think about it, Keith. And he, he talks to me that way, by the way. So <laughs> we just have like real conversations. He says, think about it. He says, he said, fatigue in the flesh. If you've, if you've ever had one of those days where, you, I mean, you were exhausted. You just worked and worked physically, exhausted yourself. You were mentally, physically, and emotionally drained. And you were at the end of yourself. You know what's amazing? You can be totally physically exhausted and get one good night's rest and wake up ready to face a new day. Right? You can go to bed, bed totally depleted of energy, but one good night's rest, and it's amazing, you can wake up ready to face a brand new day. But, think about this, but when you have mental, emotional fatigue, there's not enough sleep, there's not enough rest, there's not enough of anything that this world has to offer that can help you overcome. And the truth is, people fall out in life, and they fall out in Christianity, and they fall out of their marriages, and they fall out of their purpose because they get fatigued in their mind. They get overwhelmed in how they're thinking about the things that they have to do. And we get taken out by the enemy. In Ecclesiastes chapter 10, look at this scripture. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 10 says this, using a dull axe requires great strength, so sharpen the blade. That's the value of wisdom. It helps you succeed. Using a dull axe requires great strength, right? If the axe is dull, you got to use more power. you got to use more strength to do the work that you're trying to do. But Solomon in his wisdom said, don't work with a dull axe. Sharpen the blade. 
Sharpen the blade. And then he says that's what wisdom does. Wisdom helps to sharpen the blade. I can work smarter instead of working harder. But there's another way. Hear me. There's another way to sharpen the blade. Look what the Bible says, Proverbs 27, 17. How do we sharpen the blade of our life? As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. So think about what these two scriptures, if you put those two scriptures together, think about what it means. It's saying we don't necessarily need more strength. We need deeper relationships. We don't need more strength. We need community. We need relationships and fellowship with other believers because guess what happens when you get in the context of Christian community? All of a sudden we get sharper, we get better, we get stronger than we ever could be on our own. Think about conversations, even as Michael shared about how revelations and insight come in those contexts of communication with other people. You learn things you didn't know. You see things you had never seen. You hear things you had never heard. And all of a sudden, the light bulb goes off. You ever had those light bulb moments? Man, I love those light bulb moments. I love it when I'm struggling with something, I'm working with something, I'm dealing with something, and I just don't know what I don't know. And all of a sudden, somebody says something. Somebody shares something, somebody shows me something, and it's like, blah, blah, you know, I mean, it's wonderful. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you realize, I don't have to work harder. I can work smarter because I'm in the context of community. I have relationships and friendships, and people are making me better than I could ever be. Now, how many of you folks in the room love Google? Anybody use Google in here? I'm a Google fan most of the time, I guess. I was thinking, as I was studying this, I was thinking about a story I'd heard years ago, and I thought, I wonder if I can find the story on Google, and ba-boom, there it was. So here we go. I'm going to share with y'all a story that I heard years ago, and I thought it was powerful and that it applied to what we're talking about today. So here's the story. It says, Dear Sir, I'm writing in response to your request for additional information on my insurance claim form. In block number three of the accident claim, I wrote, trying to do the job alone as the cause of my accident. You said in your letter that I should explain this statement more fully, so I trust the following details will be sufficient. I'm a bricklayer by trade. And on the date of the accident, I was working alone on the roof of a new six-story building. When I completed my work, I discovered that I had about 500 pounds of bricks left over. Rather than carrying the bricks down by hand, I decided to lower them in a barrel using a pulley which had already been attached to the building at the sixth floor. Securing the rope at the ground level, I went up to the roof, swung the barrel out, and loaded the bricks into the barrel. Then I went back down to the ground, untied the rope, holding it tightly to ensure a slow descent of the 500 pounds of brick. You will note in block number 22 in the claim form that my weight is 150 pounds. Due to my surprise at being jerked off the ground so suddenly, I lost my presence of mind and forgot to let go of the rope. <laughs> Needless to say, I proceeded up the side of the building at a very rapid rate of speed, and about the vicinity of the third floor, I met the barrel coming down. This explains for my fractured skull and my collarbone. Slowed only slightly, I continued my rapid ascent, not stopping until the fingers on my right hand were two knuckles deep into the pulley. By this time, I had regained my presence of mind and was able to hold tightly to the rope in spite of my pain. At the approximate same time, however, that the barrel of bricks hit the ground, the bottom fell out of the barrel. Devoid of the weight of the bricks, the barrel now weighed about 50 pounds. I refer you again to the information in block number 11. As you might imagine, I now began a rapid descent down the side of the building. About the vicinity of the third floor, I met the barrel coming up. And this accounts for my two fractured ankles and the lacerations on my legs and my lower body. This second encounter with the barrel slowed me enough to lessen my energies when I fell on the pile of bricks and fortunately only broke three vertebrae. I am sorry to report, however, that as I lay on the bricks in pain, unable to stand and watching the empty barrel six stories above me swing in the air, I again lost my presence of mind and let go of the rope. <laughs> the empty barrel then descended down the side of the building, breaking both my legs. 
I hope this has furnished information sufficient to explain why trying to do the job alone was the reason for my accident. We need each other. And the truth is, how many times have we found ourselves in desperate, dark places because we tried to do it all on our own? Amen? So look at that next point. We need each other because we need somebody to walk with us. We need somebody to work with us. But we also need others, think about this, to watch out for us. Somebody to watch out for us. Community is God's answer to defeat. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, the Bible says this, Be sober-minded, be watchful, because your adversary the devil walks around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. How many know there's a real devil and he doesn't like you? <laughs> and we are at war, right? We have an adversary. We have an adversary, an enemy who wants to steal, kill, and destroy our lives. And we need people to watch out for us. Community is God's answer to defeat. You know why? Because we all have blind spots. We all have areas in our life that we just don't see the scheme or the strategy of the enemy. I, I love what... Uh, Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 12 look what he says a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated but two can stand back to back and conquer and three are even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken community is God's answer to defeat we get attacked and defeated because we're fighting alone and if you're not in a community of faith where there's somebody watching out for your back, you're really in trouble. Because the devil doesn't play fair. And he takes advantage of our weak moments. And he takes advantage of our difficult times. And he comes in during trauma and during grief. And he tries to take advantage of us in our darkest hours. But when we're in community together, there's somebody watching out for my soul. There's somebody that's got my back. That says, hey, Keith, you need to think about that. Hey, Keith, you need to pray about that. Hey, Keith, you need to reconsider that. Don't, don't rush into that. Don't make that decision so quickly. Why don't you step back just a minute and take a little time before you jump off the bridge, so to speak. How many of you know that when, when you feel threatened because you're under attack, we tend to make rash, rushed decisions? That many times are driven out of the emotion of fear and anxiety instead of out of a spirit of faith and obedience to God. And I need somebody that's watching for me. I need somebody, when I'm about to jump off that ledge, they say, whoa, hold on a minute. Have you checked down there yet? That creek dried up 10 years ago. There's no water. <laughs> You're going to make a sudden stop, right? I, I need those people in my life. And let me just tell you, you do too. As a pastor, I can tell you that I usually get brought in on the tail end of problems and difficulties, right? People have already made choices and decisions that have ended them in a bad place. And then they come to me and we're trying to dig our way out of a hole. Let me give you some advice today. Before you dig the hole, ask somebody. Before you dig the hole, ask somebody. Before you make that rash decision, before you jump off the cliff, before you make that big purchase, before you jump into that relationship decision that's going to change your life, why don't you talk to somebody, right? The Bible says a wise man seeks counsel, and a wise man receives counsel. Why? Because he knows the value of community that, hey, I've got blind spots. And sometimes I get so emotionally engaged that I can't intellectually or spiritually discern the path that God really wants me to go down. I'm going to say it again. Sometimes I get so emotionally engaged. You ever wanted something so bad that you just had to buy it? And you didn't even drive the car off the lot and you were already regretting the fact that you got 60 months of payments you can't even afford? But you wanted it so bad emotionally engaged to such a point that you couldn't intellectually or spiritually discern. We need people watching out for us just to say, hey, maybe you should think about that. Hey, why don't we pray about that? 
And all of a sudden, you realize there's value in that. God gives us community to spare us from the attacks and the defeat of the enemy, taking us out as easy targets. Look at that next point. We need each other, think about this, to wait and weep with us. We need others who will wait and weep with us. Why? Because community is God's answer to despair. Now, let me just be really honest with you this morning. Waiting is hard. <laughs> it's hard. If you're waiting on a breakthrough, you're waiting on healing in your body, you're waiting on financially things to turn around, you're waiting on a marriage to be restored, you're, you're, you're waiting on a prodigal son or daughter to come home. I'm just telling you, waiting is hard. It's hard, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard. It's difficult when you're waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting. And waiting usually leads to weeping because if you wait alone, the tendency is to allow the spirit of despair to creep in to your life. And before you know it, you start waiting and weeping, you start losing hope, and you start waiting and weeping, and you start giving up, and you start waiting and weeping, and before you know it, this, this spirit of despair has settled over you, and you're like, it's no even, I, I'm not even going to try anymore. You ever met somebody that was at that place? I, I'm not even going to try. It's not even worth fighting for my marriage anymore. I'm not, I'm not even going to try to, to pay the bill. I can't, I can't manage it. It's just too hard. I can't even do it. Have you ever met anybody like that? Have you ever been that person? <laughs> I've been there, done that. And the answer to despair is community. The answer to despair is community because we need people that are going to wait with us and we need people that are going to weep with us. Look, look with me at the scripture. 1 Peter 3 verse 8. It says, finally, all of you should be of one mind, sympathize with each other, love others as brothers and sisters, be tenderhearted, and keep a humble attitude. Sympathize with each other. We ought to have sympathy and compassion for one another. Let me, let me just tell you, let me tell you one of the obstacles that people face, specifically in the church. Sometimes people in church get offended and leave the church because they had a need and nobody helped to meet it. But here's the problem most of the time. If you have a need and nobody knows about it, how can they meet that need? See, if you're not in community, you can be coming to church, right? We learn in roles, but we connect in circles, right? You can come to church every Sunday and smile at all the people around you and worship together and pray together and listen to sermons together and even respond to the Holy Spirit together. But unless you connect with another living, breathing person, you may be in the darkest hour of your need. And I, I, I believe, I, I, I confess, I am a spiritually minded man, but I am not a mind reader. Amen. And we don't know what we don't know. So if you have a need and nobody knows that you have a need because you're not in community with somebody, then guess what? We can't meet a need that we don't know about. That's the power of community. In the power of community, we can wait together because now we know there's a need. We know there's a struggle. We know there's an issue. We're praying with you. We're encouraging you. We're standing with you. We're coming alongside you. And all of a sudden, you got people in your life. How many of you know you don't need everybody, but you need somebody? That's why we call them small groups. Because when 250 people gather together on a Sunday morning, you don't have time to get to know everybody. But when you get 10 or 12 people in the living room, Man, you can start building relationships. You can start living life together. You can start connecting. You can start sharing those things. And all of a sudden, you got somebody that's waiting with you. They're waiting with you in breakthrough. They're waiting with you in that, for that healing. They're waiting for restoration to come. They're waiting for that prodigal to come home. And they're waiting and they're weeping with you. Look what Romans 12, 15 says. It says, be happy with those who are happy. Man, that's fun. But then it says, weep with those who weep. Weep with those who weep. Why? Because we care about one another. And we're in community together. And we need each other. Waiting and weeping together. The Lord gave me just three simple thoughts. He said, Keith, when you wait and you weep together, it does three things. Number one, it changes your perspective. Because all of a sudden you realize you're not the only person that's going through what you're going through. 
When you get in community and you really start sharing life together and you're waiting on a breakthrough, you're waiting on a healing, you're waiting on something to happen in your life, all of a sudden you find out somebody in that group's kind of been where you've been. They've crossed that bridge. They've navigated those waters. They've overcome those challenges. They've been right where you were at another time or another season in their life. And all of a sudden, it changes your perspective because you realize, hey, I'm not alone. And I'm not the only person facing this. And if God did it for them, then just maybe he'll do it for me. It changes your perspective. It brings clarity to the chaos. Man, when you're waiting and weeping all by yourself, Here's what happens. One of the greatest dangers of waiting and weeping alone is, is that when you're going through that season where you're waiting a breakthrough or a miracle or healing or whatever it is, you're waiting and you're struggling, you're waiting and weeping. One of the greatest challenges we face is, is everything just gets cloudy when you're waiting alone. And not only does everything get cloudy, but God seems distant. It's like, God, I've been praying for weeks and months and years and nothing's changed. And God, I'm waiting on you. And God, I'm looking to you. And, and God just seems like he gets further and further and further away. But if you wait and weep in community, you have the hands and feet of Jesus loving on you. You have the hands and feet of Jesus encouraging you. You have the hands and feet of Jesus praying for you and weeping with you and, and, and spurring you on that, hey, God's going to make a way. And all of a sudden, community clarifies the chaos. And all of a sudden, you begin to see more clearly than you'd ever seen before. And now you can wait with an expectation of faith because you're not alone. Amen? And look at that next point. We need each other. Why do we need each other? Because we need people not just to wait with us, not just to work with us, not just to watch for us, and not just to walk with us, but we need others to stretch us. See, community is God's answer to complacency. Now, let me tell you the natural tendency of our flesh. The natural tendency of our flesh is to get comfortable. <laughs> right, let's be honest. We all love comfort. That's why we have cushioned chairs in church. Those uncushioned pews just don't work in 2023. Because we like comfort, right? We, we want some comfort. We are a creatures of comfort. Think about how much money, time, and energy you will spend and invest in creating comfort. And with comfort comes complacency. Brother Curtis talks about he's got a little 9 o'clock chair. He don't get into it very often, but every now and then he'll hit in his 9 o'clock chair and he kicks back and he kind of checks out. And I'm telling you, when you get in that 9 o'clock chair, it's hard to get up. I got a little lazy boy recliner in my house. When I get in that chair in the evenings, whoo, last thing I want is an emergency phone call. <laughs> I'll take it, but I don't want it. Read all that. I'm going to check it out. We do that in our lives. We get comfortable. We get complacent in our Christianity. We just kind of go through the motions and we go to church and we love God and we tithe and we give. And every now and then we'll tell somebody about Jesus. And we're just riding this little cushy roller coaster. And God in heaven is calling us to grow. God in heaven is calling us to come to a new place of life, a new place of energy where we're not just just cruising along. I ain't got the cruise control set on. Man, I'm, 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 I'm pushing this thing. Because God is always calling us deeper and further and faster than we've ever went before. And it's not that God's against your comfort. He is against your complacency. Where you become stagnant and stale. So you know what God will do? God will use community. God will use people. Let me just say something. People will mess you up. Right? People will challenge you. People will stretch you. People will push your buttons. And, and the natural tendency is, is it's easier just to do life alone. It may be easier, but it's not healthier. And it doesn't produce fruit. The fruit of Christianity happens in the context of community. And so I want to do something this morning. I want to ask Miss Sharon George, if she would, to come 
And I've asked her to share a little testimony that she has written out. Come on, Miss Sharon, make your way up here this morning. Let's give Miss Sharon a great big Liberty Church welcome this morning. Miss Sharon's been a part of our Liberty Church family for about 12 years. And you're going to hear a testimony how that over 25 years ago in another state, in another church, she got connected to community. And how that now over 25 years later, it's still impacting her life. Miss Sharon, I love you. First of all, Nick has said i got to hold this thing where everybody can hear me. And I do have a tendency to wave it around. So forgive me. Well, what I tell you today may cause both laughter and maybe some crying, but it is a testament to the benefit of belonging to a small group. Before moving to Alabama from California, I had joined Saddleback Church, which is known as a mega church. I had not been inside a church for decades. And when I say decades, I can beat the record of the Israelites, 41 years. But I felt something was missing in my life. Saddleback emphasizes small groups, obviously because they have thousands and thousands of attendees. My first experience was a class seminar where they had tables set up in a room and you walked in, randomly selected a table to sit down, which had a leader. It was an interesting experience, but short-lived because it was only just a few weeks for the seminar. Sometime later, Saddleback did what's called a host home event where people could sign up for a one-time introduction to the small group experience. So I signed up to attend one to get information about small groups and explore my options. The host did a great job of promoting small groups and gave everyone a chance to give a short bio. We were a diverse group at this host home two couples and three women, as I recall. At the end, the host explained that we were now considered a small group and would need to choose a leader. Well, I was a little surprised since I was only in option mode, but I went along. The host explained he would now pray and each of us during this prayer would evaluate and decide of all the people that were there in the room who would become the leader. Then at the end of the prayer, we would raise our heads and point to that person. Well, I thought about it, and I decided on a woman that was sitting across from me. The prayer ending, I raised my head to point to the woman across from me. Instead, everyone, and I mean all eyes and fingers, were pointed at me. <laughs> Definitely a deer in the headlight moment. There was no way I was there to only check out a small group concept. Fear, denial, disclaimer, all flashed before me. And the host sat there smiling like, well, we have a leader. And then I, and I capitalize and bold this, decided this could work. Why? Well, my husband is what's considered then a poinsettia lily. Poinsettia being Christmas, lily being Easter. In other words, he's a reluctant church attender. My idea was, I could get him to join the small group, then attend church more often, and hopefully he would find salvation as had I. Needless to say, this did not work out too well. He stayed in the family room watching TV, and the two couples soon found a group better suited to their requirements. Another lady moved away, and then it just left the woman I had originally chosen 
to be the leader and me. The bond, however, was formed and we decided to, to continue the small group. It would take maybe six months for our small group to fully grow. We prayed over the empty chair and gradually women came to us. One woman told me she had joined the group because she felt appreciated and valued. Our small group grew close and we shared so much and we learned so much. One of the women in the group was originally from Hazel Green, Alabama. Anybody here from Hazel Green? <laughs> and she became my mentor. She has since passed away and I could imagine her in heaven corralling the Apostle Paul to raise an issue on Jesus' teaching. <laughs> we had another lady who often complained that her husband, whose family had immigrated from Persia, which we know as Iran, was not a Christian. One Sunday while she attended Saddleback, her daughter led her dad to Christ. Now, in small group, she complained since he was saved <laughs> and on fire with God. He wanted her to go to different religious events. My comment to her was this. For years, you have complained your husband was not a Christian, and now you're complaining about how much of a Christian he is? Of course, it was all said in fun, and we had a good laugh out of it. Another woman's stepdaughter was in a high-speed car accident. I'm sorry. And I still cry when I think of the early Saturday morning call when the couple were first told the daughter survived and was in surgery, and she asked me to contact everybody to pray for her stepdaughter and also to pray for the family of the other girl in the vehicle that had not survived. Then when they arrived at the hospital, they found out that the police had misidentified her with another girl who was the survivor and their daughter was DOA. In summary, I was undecided many, many years ago about small groups, but I am so grateful that I attended that host home event. Our small group became a family growing in fruition. We shared each other's burdens and we celebrated each other's joys. And today, here at Liberty Church, I am blessed to be a member of a small group that allows us to grow in Christ, enjoy fellowship with one another, and mirror the service of Christ and the love and forgiveness that comes from God. The value of joining a small group is more than learning about being a Christian. Anyone who holds back because of a lack of commitment or fear of having others judge you, or perhaps you've had a bad experience with another church or a small group, you're missing the opportunity to be in fellowship, not only with others, but also with God. A small group is there in the worst and the best of times. It is the cement that binds us to the teachings of Jesus and the love of God. It furthers our longing to belong, knowing that when we share something in a meeting, we are not being judged, nor will anything be revealed outside the small group meeting. Amen. I love you, Ms. Sharon. And what I loved about Miss Sharon's story was that it wasn't an easy journey. That there were challenges and there were difficulties and everything didn't work out the way she thought it should work out. But God. But God worked through all those difficulties to stretch her, to challenge her, to grow her, to help her 
now over 25 years later still value that very first small group. Think about that. Those stories that she shared today that literally brought tears to her eyes were over 25 years ago. But yet the bond, the connection, the community that she built in those relationships still impact her life today. And I thought, what a great idea on how to choose small group leaders too, by the way. So we're going to bow our heads, I'm going to pray, and then you point at somebody. We're not doing that this time, but I'm holding on to that, Miss Sharon. So I, I like that idea. But you know what, folks? We need each other. We need each other in the good times and the bad times. And I'm so thankful you're here on Sunday morning to worship with us. And I, I pray we can never build a building big enough to hold the people that God brings to Liberty Church. I pray we can never plant enough campuses to reach the people that God wants to bring in to gather to worship and grow in the grace and knowledge of God. But at the end of the day, it's the connection and community that changes things. It's the connection and community. It's taking that next step. Like Michael and pressing through the fear. Like Miss Sharon just stepping out there and saying, I'm not sure if I really want to do this, but I'm going to show up and see what happens. And you'll be amazed at what God can do. Wouldn't it be amazing that in 25 years for some of you, that's, you would think, or all the young people, you're like, boy, I'd be old. And for all of us old people, we're like, praise God, I'm still alive. Wouldn't it be great that in 25 years you could look back on this 40 days of community and recognize that 25 years later you've got friendships and you've got relationships and you've got memories that make you laugh and make you cry because you connected with other believers. So I want our prayer teams to come and we're just going to let you stand to your feet. We're going to go into a final song of worship this morning. And I want to just open the altar to you today. And, and here, here's what I want to do as we open the altar and we go into this last song of worship. Maybe you're walking along today. Maybe you're walking alone today. And maybe you just need somebody to pray with you. You just need somebody to encourage you. Maybe you've become overcome by fatigue. Maybe you're just overwhelmed in your mind. You feel like life is coming at you so fast, so furious. You don't even know what the next step looks like. Man, we'd love to pray with you this morning. Community is God's answer for fatigue. Man, maybe you're waiting and weeping. And maybe you've got a prodigal son or daughter. Or maybe there's a health issue that you're battling through. Maybe you're believing God for restoration in a relationship. And you've been waiting and weeping and waiting and weeping all by yourself. Man, we would love to wait and weep with you. We'd love to pray with you this morning and just come alongside you in that season of waiting and let God work in your life this morning. Maybe you're here today and maybe you're like, Pastor Keith, I, I, I really want to be stretched. I know I've, I've become complacent. I know I've kind of just settled in. I've gotten comfortable and I, I'm not really growing. I'm not really maturing. I'm just doing what I've always done for the last six months or maybe even six years and I want to grow. Man, we'd love to pray with you this morning that God would just begin to stretch you. And the answer to all of these things is not just a prayer and an altar. The answer to all of these things is community. It's connecting. It's getting in a small group. It's taking that next step. It's going to the website, the app, or picking up that paper on the information center, making a call or shooting an email, say, hey, I'm interested in your group. Can I be a part? And, and we, we want to connect you. We want to help you build those relationships.